Hi, I'm Kat and today we are talking about a true crime case of course. I'll also be translating a word from Romanian into English and doing my makeup at the same time. So, so before we get started, today's case was requested by Patricia Burns, one of my longtime YouTube subscribers. And let's get started with the word for today. The word in Romanian for today is fraud. Fra u d fraud. Well done, guys. You just said fraud. I have glitter all over my face still from my makeup from yesterday. For some reason, when you put glitter on, no matter how much your makeup remover you use, there will still be bits left. So yeah, that's what I'm dealing with. You know the saying, guys, like mother, like son. Today we are talking about a case that, like I said, was requested by Patricia Burns. But the question is, was Kenneth manipulated by his mother or was he just like her? You know how the saying goes, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So I think we should start with the mastermind here. But really, I'm hoping that you won't get confused because this case has so many twists and turns and so many timeline jumps. It's just completely unreal and uh, anyway i'll try to make it as clear as i possibly can sante luis singers was born on 24th of july 1934 on the edge of oklahoma city her father rotten was east indian and her mother mary was irish she was the third of four children after they migrated to southern california in the late 30s her father rotten abandoned the family their mother Mary, to support the children, became a prostitute in Los Angeles and the children found themselves in foster homes or in orphanages. Sante was the last to be separated from her mother. She used to hang out at a soda shop on Melrose Avenue in Los Angeles. The couple who owned the place, Kelly and Dorothy Seliman or Siliman, also owned a movie theater in the same block and you know from time to time they would let Sante to watch a movie for free. Dorothy had a sister who couldn't really conceive children with her husband and they were looking to adopt. Edwin and Mary Chambers were more than willing to share their home with a child in need. Ed, who was a military man, was about to take an important position as the third highest ranking officer in the Nevada National Guard and so they wondered if Sante would like to move to Carson City with them. And Sante agreed. Sante's friend Ruth Tainis said that Sante moved there in the seventh grade. Whilst she went by the name Sante Singers, kids really made fun of her. So she then changed the name and she went by the name Sandy Singer. Then when she was adopted, her name became Sandra Chambers. But her friends would always call her Sandy. Sandy Chambers appeared to just fit in. She went to Carson High School, she got good grades, she was a cheerleader for the basketball team, the historian for the Spanish club, member of the Glee club and co-editor of the school's newspaper, The Chatter. But she was best known for being boy crazy and a flirtatious girl. She ran for a freshman class office and the following year for a sophomore class post but she lost both times, so she never tried again for those. Duane Glansman, the 1952 senior class president, said that they all felt quite guilty for treating Sante as an outsider. But there was a darker side emerging from Sante as well. She was caught shoplifting at a local five and dime, you know, like those one pound shops here in the UK or the one dollar shops uh, in the US. But she was never prosecuted for this. She once stole her adoptive father's credit card and went on a shopping spree. But Sante, she really seemed to be happy and overall doing quite well. So much so that when her own mother showed up in Carson City one day and wanting to take her back, Sante refused. On her high school graduation day in June of 1952, Sante told everyone that she was going to college, get a degree and become a journalist. However, three months later, she married a high school sweetheart, Lee Powers, but divorced him three months later. 
Afterwards, she took a six-week secretarial course at a Reno Business School and then she spent two years bouncing around Northern California, San Francisco and Sacramento with her friend Ruth Tainis, alternating between office work and college courses. By most accounts, Sante had a blast at that time. I know that it might seem like, you know, I'm giving you too much info into Sante's life before we get to the actual crimes, but I'm telling you guys, her whole life would be a crime. Sante eventually returned to Carson City and ended up marrying another high school admirer, Edward Walker, in 1956. They had a child together, Kent, but the marriage didn't last. Her husband accused her of stealing and shoplifting and she was arrested in 1961 in Sacramento for petty theft. Sante ended the marriage and returned to Los Angeles where she alternated between prostitution and crime. Court records show that she was arrested for grand theft in Los Angeles in 1965 and auto theft a few days later in Norwalk, California. According to one of her former lawyers, Sante walked into a Cadillac dealership and scammed the salesman into allowing her to test drive a convertible alone, of course. But Sante never went back to the dealership and drove the car for a few months as if she owned it. And when the police caught up with her, she told them she was given the car to test drive and that's what she was doing, still test driving it after a few months, a few months later. The names of Sante Singers and her other aliases were just filling up the police records of Southern California. There was a charge against her in Glendale in 1968 and another grand theft charge in Riverside the next year. She also worked as a prostitute in Palm Springs. She ended contact with her adoptive parents and when Mary Chambers died of cancer in 1969, Sante didn't even attend the funeral. By then, Sante was looking for the big score, something or someone who could make her rich for the rest of her life. She started looking for a soulmate that had the same ideas as her and who enjoyed the rush and the thrill of stealing just like she did. His name was Kenneth Kimes, a hustler just like she was. He was worth almost $10 million when Sante met him. But the wealth didn't stop them from attempting to scam everyone who got in their way, including the President of the United States. They had a son, Kenny or Kenneth, who would be trained from birth to behave as if he was the devil's spawn on earth. So, just so we don't get confused with the names, let's call Kenneth, Sante's partner, Ken Sr. and their son, Kenneth, Kenny. Kenneth Kimes, Sante's third husband and Kenny's dad, was born in Prague, Oklahoma, in 1916. Around the time Sante was being born, Ken Sr. was on his way to California with three brothers and two sisters riding on a flatbed truck part of the Great Depression migration. For years, the family moved up and down the valleys of the Golden State, picking melons and harvesting lettuces for pennies a day. Even with a low salary, Ken Sr. had the mentality of the times, saving part of each pay, which eventually grew into some really good savings. Several decades later, Ken Sr. would say that he used to be the fastest melon picker in the San Joaquin Valley. When World War II began, Ken Sr. was among the first to enlist. He spent the war years helping to liberate and then occupy the Aleutian Islands from the Japanese. He spent three years on the isles off the coast of Alaska, trading guns with the indigenous population for fresh fish and caribou, which is basically reindeer, which he then resold to the mess hall. He also operated a small casino inside a Quonset hut. By Victory Day, Ken Sr. managed to send a substantial amount of money back home. During one of his leaves, he married Charlotte Taylor. They had two children, a boy and a girl, and began the post-war years with a bit of cash. Everyone seemed to be buying cars, highways were being built, and the couple decided to get into the construction business. 
After building a few apartment complexes and trailer parks, they began focusing on motels. They built around 30 motels and sold them off for really good profit. It didn't really take long for them to figure out that they could make even more money by building these motels and then owning and operating them. Their chain was built directly across the street from a newly constructed Disneyland. The 100 room complex was called the Mecca Hotel. But Charlotte soon discovered that her husband had a dark side. He began controlling her, giving her an allowance and telling her what she could and couldn't buy. Ken Senior's mother and his sister lived in the small mansion in Orange County and on her husband's orders insisted on going everywhere with her. Ken Senior would be away for weeks at a time, but also Charlotte found out that there was a woman near every motel her husband built. Charlotte recalled that even though Ken Senior made so much money, he never relaxed. Money became his god and he also loved women. He got away with it for a very long time. Charlotte eventually filed for divorce in 1963, but Ken Senior hired former attorney general for the state of California to represent him. In the end, he got away with most of their fortune, but Charlotte had absolutely no regrets. And now we get to how Ken Sr. meets Sante. There are two stories as to how they met. Sante saw an article on California millionaires in a magazine in 1971 and she liked his looks and of course his net worth as well. The second story is that he actually went after her. He needed a public relations person for an American bicentennial scheme that he was working on, one in which he hoped to make several million dollars. But Ken Sr. had more than met his match. At first, Sante behaved like the perfect partner. She would personally stir his whiskey cocktails with her little finger while pretending to keep up with him drink for drink. Instead, hers would be chucked away into a planter or a wastebasket. When he would get drunk, she would then take charge. And if needed, she could perform every sexual trick in the book. Ken Sr. may have once controlled Charlotte, his ex-wife, but it was Sante who was controlling Ken Sr. now. Sante even asked him what his favorite flower was and when he told her she went to the perfume shop and asked them to duplicate the fragrance so she could wear it. Ken Sr. was just eating out of Sante's hand. But she wasn't the wife just yet. It took 10 years for Ken Sr. to marry her. By that time their son Kenny would be 6 years old Sante would have escaped a lengthy prison term and was already beginning to teach their son the tricks of the trade. The scheme planned by Ken Sr. and put into motion by Sante involved making money from the 1976 American Bicentennial. It was called the Forum of Men. Although this sounded quite fancy, they were really just, you know, trying to sell giant posters of state flags that celebrated the 200th birthday of the United States. They had the idea that by simply being seen in the right Washington circles and being photographed in the right places, the government would put a poster in every classroom in America and sell the excess through post offices. They estimated that there were 250,000 schoolrooms and at $10 each poster they would make two million and a half dollars. But Ken Sr. really needed credentials and so he began addressing civic groups on patriotism. He also began even calling himself the honorary bicentennial ambassador of the United States and even said that he would soon be traveling throughout the world to let other countries know about the forthcoming celebration. But an official sanction was needed and it wasn't long before the couple showed up at the White House to meet with Patricia Nixon. You are probably asking yourself, how did they manage to do that? Well, Ken Sr. and Sante forged a memo on White House stationery that claimed was to Mrs. Nixon from a high-ranking White House assistant asking her to see him. It represented Ken Sr. as this big Republican donor and philanthropist who only wanted to give back to his country. But Mrs. Nixon appeared to see right through their pitch and sent the White House photographer away 
but Sante got out her own camera and of course captured the event which soon appeared in the Bicentennial Times, the official newsletter for the big year. Sante and Ken Sr. seemed to be halfway there and they used the photo with Mrs. Nixon to arrange meetings with other officials. On February 26, 1974, Sante and Ken Sr. hoping to get some invitations to visit foreign countries as honorary ambassadors began the evening by sneaking past the Secret Service at the Blair House reception for Vice President Gerald Ford, where they had a conversation with him on their plans for their worldwide bicentennial tour. Sante wore large diamonds on every finger, but spoiler, they were actually fake. She even told the woman that she was from East Indian royalty and to another woman that she was a full-blooded American Indian. But they were not finished. Sante and Ken Senior took a cab and attended parties or receptions at the West German Embassy, the Belgian Embassy, and finally they had a sit-down dinner at the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery. At the Belgian residence, Sante made a pitch for the flag posters before being asked to leave. They could have actually gotten away with the whole scam, but the problem was that the next morning, Washington Society editors were bombarded with phone calls. Two days later, a Washington Star headline read, quote, The biggest crash since 1929. This is a story of how good manners and gall will get you into the world of Washington Society. The caption under Ken Sr. and Sante's picture said in part, Climbs rhymes with climbs. The Washington Post got an investigative team on the story and soon reported that the letter used to get an audience with uh, Patricia Nixon was forged. After being exposed, Sante told the reporter that Ken Sr. was a Will Rogers type, a self-starter and a tiger. People ask me if I'm involved with him. Well, I love him. I just love his warmth. Sante said they were doing the project just to get rid of the cynicism in the world. Now, think for a moment about Kenny, their son. He was born in 1975 to a mother and father who both loved to steal and scam people just for the thrill of it. Sante would shower Kenny with an unnaturally close form of love from an early age. Ken Sr., his dad, was drunk more often than he was sober and he seemed to be controlled by Sante like a puppet. Kenny saw police and investigators constantly showing up at their home to look into all these different schemes that his parents were doing. It's safe to say that Kenny didn't actually have a normal life. Vittorio Rajo lived next door to Kenny when his family had the Las Vegas house. 
They also had homes in Hawaii, the Bahamas and California. Vittorio said that he was Kenny's first real friend. Kenny was a wonderful friend, but he believed that Kenny used family money to buy his friendship, since Kenny often paid for both of them when they went to the movies or even to McDonald's. And Vittorio's dad, Benito, remembered Sante, Kenny's mom, as someone who looked a lot like the actress Elizabeth Taylor. She would dress in white all the time and with the way she would have her hair and makeup done, she looked just like Elizabeth Taylor. But Benito also saw another side of Sante, a cruel, condescending one. She told him that her son Kenny was the genius one and his son Vittorio wasn't and she didn't really want them together. When Kenny couldn't find any friends in the neighborhood, Sante would hire friends for him. In Hawaii, they had Kara Craver Jones, the hired playmate. Kenny wasn't allowed to have any other friends and they had to do what his mom said when she said it. Kenny never talked back and Sante was really dominant of him of Kara and of everybody really. She even told Kara that she was going to send her and Kenny to Russia as youth ambassadors. But of course, that never actually happened. Kara was picked up each day in a limousine to visit Kenny and from time to time Kenny would confide in her although he often made the stories up. He would tell her that they had mafia problems and when Kara saw Sante's wigs on a nightstand, Kenny on the spot came up with the story that his mother has cancer and had to go for chemotherapy treatments. But of course this wasn't real. As you can see, Kenny learned from his parents from a very young age. Tell a story, win sympathy and unbalance the mark. Two weird things that visitors noticed about Kenny's family were the locks and the maids. Once inside their house, there was no way to get out unless Sante would let you out with a key. Each of their houses came with several Mexican maids whom Sante forced to go barefoot. Once one of them got out and the Rajos, their neighbors, remembered her screaming as she ran down the street until Sante captured her and brought her back. They were a really strange family. Sante kept getting arrested for grand, for grand theft, petty theft and schemes that involved claiming that an item was stolen from her home, putting an inflated price tag on it and getting an insurance company to pay. Houses owned by Ken Sr. and Sante would mysteriously burn to the ground and an insurance company would have to write an even larger check. Sante narrowly escaped prison in February of 1980 after stealing a mink coat from the Mayflower Hotel. A woman called Catherine Kenworthy left her dark ranch mink over a chair in the Mayflower's town and country lounge. Sante, having already been noticed because of her resemblance to Elizabeth Taylor, focused on this coat. As Ken Sr. distracted the woman, with conversation, Sante strolled over, slipped the coat on, then put on her own fur coat over it and walked away. Catherine reported the coat stolen and uh, Rina Beachy, who witnessed this, described to police and hotel staff that the fat Liz Taylor stole it. So they really figured out it was Sante, who was staying with Ken Sr. and Kenny in a suite on the seventh floor of the hotel. When the police showed up at the door, they found the coat. The initials had been freshly cut out with a razor blade and there were also several other mink coats, all with the labels and any identifying features removed. There was also a men's top coat that was reported stolen. Sante was charged with the theft of the fur coat, Ken Sr. with the men's coat. Both of them posted a $4,000 bond and left town. Over the next five years, Sante kept getting her trial delayed by always having letters from mysterious doctors in Mexico sent just before trial. The note said that she was either too sick to travel or that she was about to have an operation. Ken Sr. got lucky when the owner of the top coat died before his trial and the charges were dropped. In 1985, Sante was finally brought to trial, but as the testimony ended and the jury deliberated, she again skipped town. The jury convicted her, but a few days later another letter was presented that said she was hit by a car, 
crossing the street just before the verdict and had flown home for treatment. Her lawyer then said she had been convicted while absent and that was illegal. And really it worked. Sante won on a technicality, but her luck would eventually run out. For years she had been traveling to Mexico where she would grab girls of the streets and import them to her homes with promises of a big salary and a better life. Instead, she didn't pay them anything. She kept them locked up inside her houses and made them work seven days a week for free. After the Washington trial, several of her slaves escaped and went to the police. Even though this meant deportation because Sante actually brought them into the country illegally. In August 1985, police swooped down on a residence Sante and Ken Sr. owned in La Jolla, California and charged them both with conspiracy to violate slavery laws. Ken Sr. and Sante claimed that their home was in Las Vegas and it was there that a trial took place. Sante was held without bail because of her leaving the mink coat trial. But before the trial, she scammed officials into moving her to a hospital because of medical complaints and she then managed to escape by crawling out of a bathroom window. But she was caught three days later at a Las Vegas bar called the Elbow Room. The bartender, who she thought was a friend, turned her in. At the trial, a lot of servants testified against her. Most of them claimed that Sante tortured them. Ana Celia Sorano said that Sante would always dismantle the phone and lock her in when she went out. Sante also slapped her around. Dolores Vasquez said that Sante hit her because she burned the hamburger bread. She threatened her with a pistol and even called her stupid. She even threw hot water on her. Maribel Ramirez said that Sante branded her with a hot iron and had the scars to prove it. She also said Sante locked her in a closet overnight. Ken Sr. cut the deal with the FBI before the trial and he got a three year suspended sentence, a $70,000 fine and agreed to enter rehab to get his alcoholism treated. Sante, for the first time in her life, went to prison. She was given five years in a federal correctional facility in Kentucky and served three years. While she was uh, still in prison, by all accounts, Ken Sr. and Kenny, they were doing quite well. When she got out in 1989, she was determined that she would never allow herself to go back to prison. And then bodies began disappearing every time the law got too close. In 1990, their family lawyer, Elmer Holmgren, burned down one of their homes for the insurance money. After having a couple of vodkas, obviously, you know, drunk at a bar, the lawyer ended up telling his story of how he burnt the house down to anyone who listened to him. The FBI got him in for a talk and he became an informant. Soon after that, Sante and Ken Sr. invited Elmer to join them on a holiday in Costa Rica. They returned from that holiday, but he never did and his body was never found. When Kenny was at the University of California at Santa Barbara, his mother Sante decided to go off with him. So she lived off campus with Kenny and Ken Sr. At the university, she often organized with Kenny keg parties. She now shared a bed with her son on the road, but not a bed with her husband. On March 28, 1994, Sante pulled up in front of a Santa Barbara bank and went inside leaving Ken Sr. by then 77 year old in the car. When she went back out, Ken Sr. was dead from a heart attack. Kenny was away on a spring break vacation in Hawaii, so Sante didn't really tell him that his father had died. Instead, she met Kenny at the airport when he returned and when Kenny asked where Papa was, Sante said he was right there showing Kenny his father's ashes inside an urn. But Kenny was horrified, especially when Sante showed him two airline tickets. She then forced him to get back on a plane and they returned to Hawaii. They disposed of Ken Sr.'s ashes by scattering them in the Pacific Ocean on a beach near Honolulu. Sante never told anyone about Ken Sr.'s death. 
when his children or old friends called asking about him, she would make up a story. He'd gone off to Japan to build a motel was one of her favorite stories. So I think that it's safe to say that Ken Sr. didn't die from a heart attack because if he would, then she wouldn't really keep it a secret and dispose of his ashes in the ocean as well, in my opinion. Ken Sr. never had his will updated and there was an old one somewhere leaving everything to his two children from his first marriage. Even though Sante could produce a marriage certificate, authorities would later doubt even the authenticity saying it appears to be forged. Sante wanted to get her hand on as much of Ken Sr.'s $12 million fortune as she could. She started with asking the help of an old real estate friend of Ken Sr.'s, David Kasdin, by creating a paper trail of documents. It soon appeared that David purchased some of Ken Sr.'s real estate empire, but Sante really got greedy. She would often get a second mortgage on the properties using all documents and then David would get a coupon book that instructed him to pay back by the month. David had allowed Sante to use his name on the deed of the home in Las Vegas, which was actually occupied by Ken Sr. and Sante in the 70s. Several years later, Sante convinced a notary to forge David's signature on an application for a loan of $280,000 with the house as collateral. When David discovered the forgery, he threatened to expose Sante. But if we know anything about Sante by now and how she doesn't like to leave witnesses behind, David made a horrible mistake because she ordered him killed. Kenny, her son, murdered David by shooting him in the back of the head. According to another accomplice's later testimony, all three participated in disposing of the evidence. David's body was found in a dumpster near Los Angeles airport in March 1998. The murder weapon was never recovered, having been disassembled and dropped into a storm sewer. Ken Sr. also had several secret bank accounts in, Car in Caribbean nations like the Bahamas and Grand Cayman. Sante began forging checks to get the money out. Authorities there believe that a Bahamian banker named Said Bilal Ahmed discovered this scheme. He scheduled a dinner meeting with Sante at the Cable Beach Hotel, but guess what? He was never seen again. The banker was killed by Kenny on his mother's orders in the Bahamas in 1996, which had been suspected by Bahamian authorities at the time. Sante and Kenny acted together to drug Ahmed, drown him in a bathtub and dump his body offshore, but no charges were ever filed in that case. Kenny dropped out of college and the two of them began in 1998 a nationwide journey that really seemed to have no purpose. They purchased the new Lincoln Town Car paying with a wordless check around the time that, K that David Kadzin was killed. They were scamming as often as they could now. They had already pulled the wordless check trick on an Alabama motorhome dealer and made off with an RV. It was in Florida that Sante first met someone who told her about an elderly woman's wonderful boarding house for the rich in the Big Apple. So mother and son left Florida and were off to New York. In June 1998, with her son Kenny, Sante came up with a scheme where she would assume the identity of their landlady, the 82-year-old socialite Irene Silverman, and then take ownership of her $7.7 .7 million Manhattan mansion. Her son Kenny was already following in his mother's footsteps. Just two months before, he helped his mom steal some lipstick from a discount store in Miami, knocking down the store detective before being arrested. Of course, their discharges were reduced, the bond was posted, and they quickly left town. Just hours before, the mother and son committed the ultimate offense. The body inside the suitcase had been the lively socialite Irene, who owned the East Side Mansion and leased out suites to those who could afford to pay $6,000 per month rent. Celebrities in town for a long stay, like singer Chaka Khan and, and pianist Peter Duchin, were two of the regular paying guests. 
Irene Silverman lived a rich, full life. She was born in New Orleans in 1916, the only daughter of an Italian fishmonger and a Greek immigrant seamstress. Her father's last name was Zambelli and the exotic surname was his claim to fame. He was related to the great Carlotta Zambelli, a ballet dancer who in the first half of the 20th century was a star of the first order. Irene's father believed that dancing was in the family genes and the girl who was then known as Irina Zambelli was given ballet lessons several times a week, even though her parents were really struggling to pay her teacher. In 1932, during the Great Depression, Irene's father left the family. I don't know what's happening with fathers leaving their families. Her mother, who still had dreams of getting Irene to be a ballerina, took her to New York to study under one of the great dance choreographers of the day, Michael Fokin. She paid for lessons by sewing ballet co costumes for him at night after her shift as a button seamstress in the garment district was finished. Irene was good, but Irene was really good, but at only 5 feet and weighing just 98 pounds, she was too tiny to dance with a major company, even by ballet standards. In 1933, Irene found a position in what was then the Corps de Ballet of Radio City Music Hall, doing four shows a day, seven days a week, for a weekly paycheck of $36. She was the shortest on stage, always at the end of the line. Her feet would often bleed through her satin slippers from being en point, a ballet technique and they would hurt so much that she sometimes had to walk home barefoot. Radio City was 75 pence for a matinee in those days and uh, really for that price you saw ballet and commercial dancers like the Rockettes but also a movie. Irene appeared in a production of Bolero which was followed by one of the hottest movies of the year, King Kong. She was nicknamed Zambi by the other dancers because he rhymed with Bambi. After eight years of working there, Irene met a man, someone who was more than a decade older than her. His name was Samuel Silverman and he was a real estate mogul whose fortunes were still on the rise. For her and him, it was a marriage of convenience. She realized she was going to be very rich. She was bright and bubbly and he was just brilliant with connections at the highest level. They got married in 1941 and part of the deal was that Irene's mother would live with them. They never had any children of their own, just money and a lot of money. Samuel was able to get some really good real estate deals in every borough of New York. After World War II, he expanded his real estate empire to countries outside of the US. They purchased a five-story mansion on East 65th Street in New York, but also owned apartments in Honolulu and the City of Lights, Paris. But sadly, in 1973, Samuel died of cancer. Irene's mother would die a few years later. For the first time in her life, Irene began to live alone. But she wasn't just going to wait around for that. She began by having the mansion divided into suites and made it into the most luxurious bed and breakfast in all of Manhattan. She always said it was for the company and not the cash. If she liked the guest, she would have the servants bring him breakfast in bed and if she really liked you, she would take you out to dinner. She began taking classes at nearby Columbia University. She was popular with the younger students, partly because she always kept a bottle of first-rate champagne in her purse and partly because she was the only person who, who not only came to classes by limousine, but would sometimes volunteer to have her driver drop off a classmate after a lecture. She became known as a charming eccentric, someone who once showed up at a party with 10 young men in tow. She would say she rented a man for the night. In 1998, Irene was 82 years old, but she had no plans to slow down. Her stylist dyed her hair Lucille Ball orange, and despite her arthritis and a bad back, she would sometimes amaze her guests by rising on tiptoes, her hands pointed above her head, like Odile in Swan Lake. When Kenny Kimes showed up on Irene's doorstep, he used one of the oldest cons in the book. First, he used the name of an old friend of hers as a reference. Then he showed her the money. He had $6,000 in $100 bills. Irene had always got checks, but she knew that cash couldn't be traced. No money for the IRS. 
Kenny Kimes was nicely dressed in a suit and he seemed okay. And when his female assistant showed up a few days later and began living with him, Irene kept quiet, but she had signed her own death warrant because in a matter of days she would be dead. That female assistant was in fact Santes, Kenny's mother. Like I said, Irene didn't need the money, she simply liked company. Her staff cleaned the small apartments that she would rent out and on this occasion, in July 1998, Irene had given the servants the holiday weekend off. On the 5th of July 1998, with everyone gone, Sante and Kenny forced Irene into their suite where, after a struggle, she was shot in the head with a stun gun that paralyzed her. Then, Kenny strangled Irene with his own hands. After that, she was wrapped in a shower curtain that was purchased just for the occasion and then tied with duct tape. Sante's plan was that she was going to tell the staff that her dear friend Irene sold her the mansion and would show them a bill of sale if necessary. The servants would buy her story and also the story that Irene had gone off on a long European vacation. Kenny moved Irene's body into a suitcase in the trunk of the Lincoln car. He got behind the wheel and the two of them turned onto Madison Avenue. After Sante and Kenny disposed of Irene's body at the suburban New Jersey construction site, they returned to New York ready to carry out the rest of their plan. A few days before killing Irene Silverman, they called an old friend Stan Patterson, who lived in a Las Vegas trailer park. He had sold Sante and Kenny guns, did some odd jobs for them and was able to keep his mouth shut. Or so they thought. Sante told him that she needed him to run a New York mansion for them for a few weeks. But the phone call would prove to be the biggest mistake of Sante's life. The FBI found Stan and talked to him about Sante. They wanted to question her about David Kasdin's murder, remember the real estate friend also about the stolen Lincoln in which they disposed of Irene's body and a few other crimes. The FBI said if Stan will lead them to Sante and Kenny, he wouldn't be prosecuted for selling guns illegally. Sante and Kenny met Stan, but Stan wore a bulletproof vest to the meeting at the New York Hilton just after Sante and Kenny finished with the disposing of Irene Silverman's body. Federal agents surrounded them and it was all over. Kenny was so frightened that he wet his trousers. Sante was brazen to the end, using an alias and loudly protesting her innocence. Give these individuals they can hold them for a 30-day period which takes to August 6th August 6th. then they can renew the application for another 30 days on good cause shown what this is is an extradition warrant all 50 states have an agreement that if somebody is held that they will hold them for the demanding state New York is what's called the extraditing state. So under our statute, there's a 30-day period. And that 30-day period, which will take us to August 6th, they have to come up with a governor's warrant. You know, that's what we're awaiting. And they have not come up with a governor's warrant. And it's very important to note that if they were that concerned about the prosecution of these individuals, why hasn't even the state of Utah come up with the governor's warrant? And in regard to those, those charges, they are civil in nature. Although they're couched in criminal terms, this was a civil dispute. And it will be shown clearly that this was a business transaction where the car was being purchased for another car, they informed the dealer that the car was defective and that the check would be stopped. Very so important. they didn't do anything criminally. And additionally, it should be noted that Santi Kimes or Kenneth Kimes never signed this check. So they're being charged with an offense where they were not even the signatories on this check. However, this was a way to hold them. And this is what we have reason to believe is the reason for this warrant.
It's for the sole and exclusive purpose of detaining them and holding them. Who is Manny Garrett? Can you explain why they were here in New York? They came to New York. They wanted to be here in New York. Why? They love the city. Why are we all here in New York? Oh, I understand that. And I want to say something to you. If someone travels various places, and if someone decides to come to New York, and then if someone has a business transaction in another state and there's a warrant, what proof is that that they've committed any wrongdoing here? It doesn't exist. It was an interesting question. Why did they want to be in New York? Why did they want to be in New York? Who? A Supreme Court judge's decision. See, if she felt that um, there were a risk of flight, then you do what most judges do. You set high bail. That's right. We believe that this As opposed was... to remanding. Usually you remand murderers, and they're not being charged with murder or anything of that nature. It's, it's solely a, a, a warrant from, from Utah, and that's it. And so what's frankly was, was frankly astonishing is the fact that, that Utah requested $20,000 bail. And that was brought into court and that was shown to the judge. And I asked the judge to take the court remands them. New York is supposed to be acting on behalf of the demanding state, whether it's Utah, California, into this court on that charge and that charge alone. And why is it that the $20,000 bail, which was requested by... Irene Silverman vanished in 1998, the same day that uh, Sante and Kenny were arrested for writing a bad $14,900 check for a car. The police found a stolen Lincoln car and inside they found a lot of incriminating evidence. Irene's passport and keys to the mansion were in the back seat, a fully loaded Glock 09 mm pistol and a .22 Beretta were also there. There were real estate transfer papers and a notebook that showed Sante practicing Irene Silverman's signature over and over again. There was also an empty stun gun box, blank social security cards, handcuffs, extra license plates, syringes and walkie talkies, a red wig, two fright masks, a pink liquid similar to a known date rape drug and $30,000 in cash. Excuse me, excuse me. My name is Matthew Weissman. I'm an attorney. We would like access to the Times residence, please. Today, outside Irene Silverman's mansion, the attorney for Kenneth Kimes was trying to get action and access to his client's room inside 20 East 65th Street. Sir, why are you walking away from me? I represent Kenneth Kimes. The Kimes attorneys say prosecutors won't show them evidence in the disappearance of the 82-year-old Silverman. They also seem to be laying the groundwork for the defense of Sante and Kenneth Kimes. Miss Silverman had, a, had her own life, a life, you know, outside of her, ever meeting my client. The attorneys say guns and ammunition found in the Kimes car actually belong to an FBI informant. And they say blood allegedly found in the car and outside the mansion won't be connected to the Kimes through DNA. Are you saying essentially that maybe your clients, they may be con artists, but they're not murderers? Well, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't, well, let's say this, they're not murderers. The Kimes have been linked to four people who have either disappeared or been murdered, and now there may be a fifth. Authorities want to know if they're linked at all to the disappearance of Jacqueline Levitz, who's the widow of the furniture store founder. Levitz bought a home in Vicksburg, Mississippi in 1995. She lived there for three weeks, but then vanished. Blood was found all over the home. Kimes' attorneys wouldn't comment on that, but insist their clients had no involvement in the Silverman case. My client categorically denies uh, any involvement with her disappearance. They also found cassettes of Irene Silverman's telephone conversations secretly taped by, by Sante and Kenny and the forged deed that transferred her townhouse to them for a fraction of its nearly $10 million value. They never found Irene's body. Sante and Kenny were tried in the spring of 2000. After several months of testimony, the jury decided Sante was guilty of 58 different crimes and Kenny was guilty of 60. 
Sante was sentenced to 120 years and Kenny to 125 years. At their sentencing, Sante was asked if she had anything to say and with that she jumped to her feet where she ranted about her life and the unfairness of her trial for more than an hour. She actually had to be stopped by the judge. A few months later, in October 2000, Kenny tried to escape by holding a court TV reporter Maria Zone hostage by pressing a ballpoint pen into her throat. In 2000, Sante Kimes and her son Kenneth were arrested for the murder of Irene Silverman, an 82-year-old Manhattan millionaires. Authorities soon uncovered a sordid tale of cross-country crime sprees and suspicious deaths. And then add into the mix this treachery and incestuous behavior and then murder. I mean, you couldn't help but watch these two. With the duo facing extradition to California to face additional murder charges, Kimes agreed to a jailhouse interview with Court TV producer Maria Zone. And he sat down and I said to myself, he looks pretty mean. But I'm not going to say anything because I have a lot of ground to cover. I have a lot of questions to ask him. Are you saying, though, that Mrs. Silverman was aware that you were sharing the apartment yeah, with your mother? Absolutely. Absolutely. But after 15 minutes, Kenneth Kimes had a question of his own. Could, um, if I may ask, uh, could we take a break in maybe five or ten minutes? Um, how about two minutes? Sure. Better. What do you need a break for? Oh, just a little, put a little water on my face. Just moments after the camera was turned off, Kimes took Zone hostage. <laughs> Kimes was holding this pen to Zone's throat. I was on the air live when an alert came over uh, the wire service saying there was a court TV reporter being held hostage by Kenneth Kimes in a prison cell. What followed was a tense standoff with Zone's life in the balance. Two handcuffs, one blanket. The next thing she knows, she's got a pen in her neck, which is a very scary thing, potentially life-threatening. In my mind, I'm thinking about the things that he's done and the things that I've read that he's done and the fact that he's been convicted of murder. And at this point, I'm really, really scared. What are you thinking that you're going to take someone hostage, a journalist, inside a prison? And that's going to get you out? I mean, that's a desperate kind of crazed person who's doing that. That could have ended a lot worse than it ended. After four excruciating hours, guards distracted Kimes and wrestled him away from Zone, ending her capture. It was very terrifying, and it was a situation that you never think you're going to be in yourself. Maria had interviewed Kenny once before without any incident. His demand was that his mother not be extradited to California where the two faced the death penalty for the murder of David Kasdin. After four hours of negotiation, Kenny removed the pen from Maria's throat. Negotiators created a distraction which allowed them to quickly remove Maria and wrestle Kenny to the ground. After three hours, he was subdued. In March 2001, Kenneth Kimes was extradited to Los Angeles to stand trial for the murder of David Kasdin. Sante Kimes was extradited to Los Angeles in June 2001. During the trial in June 2004, while he was facing the death penalty, Kenny changed his plea from not guilty to guilty and implicated his mother in the murder in exchange for a plea deal that his mother not receive the death penalty if convicted. He also confessed to killing the Bahamian banker Said Bilal Ahmed by first drugging him, then drowning him in a bathtub and later disposing of the body in the ocean. Sante Kimes again made a prolonged statement denying the murders and accusing police and prosecutors of various kinds of misconduct and was again eventually ordered by the presiding judge to be silent. The sentencing judge in the David Kasdin case called Mrs. Kimes one of the most evil individuals they had met in their time as a judge. No body, no crime, Kenny told the judge, revealing the Kimes family motto. Even though her son ratted her out, Sante maintained her innocence and tried to play the sympathy card. Her court appearances included arrivals via wheelchair, 
fainting spells, a heart attack and continuous crying. The judge, Kathleen Kennedy Powell, didn't really buy this, particularly after Sante took to name calling and repeatedly called the prosecutor Mr. D.A. Death. Each of them received another life sentence that was added onto the more than 100 years they were already serving. Even though the David Kasdin murder happened first, the crimes were apprehended in New York City and tried first for the Irene Silverman murder. Evidence recovered from their car helped establish the case for trying them on David Kasdin's murder as well. The Silverman trial was unusual in a lot of aspects, including the rare combination of a mother-son team and the fact that no body was recovered. But the jury was unanimous in voting to convict them of not only murder, but 117 other charges, including robbery, burglary, conspiracy, grand larceny, illegal weapons possession, forgery and eavesdropping on their first poll on the subject. The judge also took the unusual step of ordering Sante Kimes not to speak to the media even after the jury had been sequestered as a result of her passing a note to New York Times reporter David Roth in court. The judge threatened to have her handcuffed during further court appearances if she persisted and restricted her phone access to calls to her lawyers. The judge contended that Sante Carnes was attempting to influence the jury as they may have seen or heard any such interviews and that there would be no cross-examination as there would be in court. Sante had earlier chosen to not take the stand in her own defense and after the judge ruled that prosecutors could question her about the previous conviction on slavery charges. During the sentencing portion of the Irene Silverman trial, Sante Kimes made a statement to the court blaming the authorities, including her own lawyers, for, for framing them. She went on to compare their trial to the Salem witch trials and claimed the prosecutors were guilty of murdering the Constitution. When the statement was concluded, the presiding judge responded that Sante was a sociopath and a degenerate and her son was a dupe and remorseless predator before imposing the maximum sentence on both of them. The jury forewoman pronounced guilty 118 times, 58 times for Sante Kimes and 60 for Kenny Kimes. How could evil suspicion fall on the family of such substance? After all, the Kimes were rich. Houses in California, Las Vegas, Hawaii, the Bahamas. Their net worth estimated at $10 million. We went on vacation to her house in the Bahamas. We flew first class, and it was wonderful. Even their car dealer, Jim Blackner of Cedar City, Utah, was impressed on the occasions he delivered the almost new Lincoln they liked to drive. Maid answers the door. A maid? Uh-huh, a maid. Makes you very welcome, very comfortable. And your impression when you left? These were good people. These were good people, yeah. These were, these were good people. Well, you know, people move. Yes, said Blackner. He'd have someone drive the car to Los Angeles, and he'd happily take her check. I asked about Mr. Kimes. Uh, I think the first conversation, he was in the shower, and uh, then he was going to call me right back, then she called me back. Uh, he had to run to Japan. Run to Japan? Uh-huh. How could he know that Kenneth Kimes Sr. wasn't in Japan? He'd been dead for five years. Monday morning, we uh, got the check. We called on it to make sure it was good. Uh, the check wouldn't clear. By the time that check bounced at Jim Blackner's car dealership in Utah, there had been many arrests, but few convictions. Astonished friends finally had to face the unpleasant truth. I had no idea that there was another side to this woman. I never saw that other side of her. Take your full name for the record. Shante Kimes. Has been conning people as far back as anybody's been able to look, says her son. And stealing whatever wasn't nailed down. Almost every time she took little Kent to the store, she'd carry a big purse. When she comes out, the purse is half full of stuff. Might be oysters, might be lipstick, might be a roast. Of roast beef. I mean, it, roast beef. I mean, it's you can put it in the oven Sunday, and cook it for dinner. Sunday dinner, yeah. And uh, yeah, we ate well. <laughs> a long time ago in Carson City, Nevada, says classmate Dwayne Glansman, the kids thought she was a wonderful young woman named Sandy Chambers. 
We were practically inseparable. But Sandy's best friend, Ruth Tannis, discovered a dark secret. Sandy told Ruth that her real mother was a prostitute in California who had begun to encourage Sandy to join the trade. She kind of wandered around on the streets in the L.A. area. But then Nevada Army Colonel Edwin Chambers adopted her when she was almost 13. Her young husband discovered to his amazement that she was stealing things. He said she became obsessed about money, was desperately afraid of being as poor as she was on the streets of L.A. She had a split personality, he said. He divorced her. Hers looked like a life headed for small-time trouble until one day she picked up a magazine called Millionaire, and in it she read about this self-made man named Kenneth Kimes. Who was he? Rich and available. Kimes had already raised a family, two children, but she caught him on the rebound, and suddenly his life got very exciting. All through my lifetime, how many maids have I had? Let's say, uh, since you were married to Mr. Kimes. Oh, gosh, 800. She felt this need to enslave people and, and to force them to work against their will. Prosecutors say they beat and imprisoned several maids. I've never yelled loudly, or, and I have certainly never uh, physically touched any of them. Remember, she was wealthy. Homes in Hawaii, La Jolla, Las Vegas, the Bahamas. And yet, because of the way she treated the women who looked after those homes, she was charged with violating U.S. slavery laws. All through my lifetime, how many maids have I had? Let's say, uh since you were married to Mr. Kimes. Oh, gosh, 800. These are the places in Mexico from which she recruited the maids. A Hawaiian neighbor named Beverly Stone was even enlisted to help Mrs. Kimes escort one of them from Los Angeles back to Honolulu. She believed in Mrs. Kimes. She was very, very um, aggressive and domineering in a really warm way and she could really talk you into anything. She said that she had never been paid, that she uh, was like a slave, that she'd been burned, threatened. Tales of horror from seven of the Kimes maids found their way to the FBI. I see Mrs. Kimes as, a, as really a predator. The maids filed a $6 million lawsuit against her in Hawaii. During her jailhouse deposition, Mrs. Kimes grew angry at the visiting lawyer. I've suffered brain concussion injuries. I've been incarcerated wrongly for three years. I've had the insurance carrier setting me up uh, in this unbelievable deposition, which is endangering my life, my freedom, our family. She turned her anger on the company that carried her homeowner's insurance, demanding that since she was accused of enslaving the maids in her home, the homeowner's insurance should cover it. But we don't insure people for keeping slaves. One lawyer who represented the insurance company, Jeff Portman, found himself opposing not just Sante Kimes, but a whole army of lawyers she was able to hire. A total of 77 lawyers, he says, though he claims not all of them were paid. She's a very evil person, a very dangerous person. Because she was so insistent, so litigious, in the end, to get Mrs. Kimes out of their hair, the insurance company agreed to settle with the maids. I think when you got below the surface, you found someone who was capable of doing virtually anything to get what she wanted. Including, investigators say, suspicious fires at her own homes and businesses. In Las Vegas, on the site now occupied by the Barbary Coast Casino, Kenneth Sr. owned a property called the Times Square Motel. When it burned down in July 1977, this report, prepared by the fire investigator, said of the cause, quote, set by human hands. The Hawaii house, this elaborate place by the sea, burned twice. Both fires suspicious. The second, in 1990, was ruled an arson fire, and the Kimes Insurance Company refused to pay. She was furious and showed up at the headquarters of Chubb Insurance in New Jersey, even went to executives' homes. At the same time, a New Jersey police report called Mrs. Kimes dangerous, cunning, a master of disguises, and an escape artist. But it was in the Bahamas that even more terrible things began to happen in the vicinity of the Kimes. By now, it was 1996.
Kenneth Sr. had died, and Shante had her son by her side when government sources in the Bahamas tell NBC News. Kimes moved to take control of her husband's offshore millions. This is the family's beachfront house in Nassau, now abandoned and crumbling. From this house, say our sources, Kimes tried to persuade banking officials to cover some failed investments. She encountered this man, Syed Bilal Ahmed, the senior auditor for the Gulf Union Bank. He say officials was investigating irregularities in the bank where the Kimes kept their money. When suddenly, he disappeared. She's a person that we very, very much would like to speak with. Bahamian Police Superintendent Douglas Hanna. Possibly the missing man was at the house where the Kimes was staying. The superintendent said Mrs. Kimes became his number one suspect. And then... And once she knew that we were inquiring about her, she appeared to have just vanished. In Florida, caught on surveillance video in a discount store. Here's Mrs. Kimes in her Liz Taylor getup stealing $19 worth of lipstick. That's Ken Jr. behind her. But as they're about to leave, they're stopped by an undercover cop. There's a confrontation. Ken tries to bolt with the purse. He doesn't get far. This is the young grifter in court as the judge gives him a break in his bond. Sir, your attorney has convinced me to reduce your bond to 10000 That's less than half of the standard bond. You've got a good lawyer. Do what she tells you. And this was the last anyone saw of Kenneth Jr. until a cross-country tour of deceit brought mother and son to New York. By the time the rest of us learned about them, another man will be found dead in a dumpster, and Irene Silverman would vanish. From the day he left college and went off with his mom, I knew his life was over as a normal functioning kid. I knew she'd drag him down. UC Santa Barbara policeman Alan Cagey and his wife Trish took Kenny in after a fight got him kicked out of his dorm at school. They came to love Kenny, but his mother? I get upset with Kenny for not standing up to her. The Cageys came to believe, like so many others before them, that Shante was a crook and tried to get Kenny away from her influence. He says, no, I have to listen and do what my mother wants. I looked at him and I said, Kenny, I said, one of these days I'm probably going to have to come visit you in prison. Sante Kimes was serving a sentence of 120 years at the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women in New York. On her prisoner paper, Sante's projected release date was March the 3rd, 2119. Additionally, Sante Kimes and her son, Kenny Kimes, were each sentenced to life for the death of David Kasdin in California. Sante died in prison on May 19, 2014 at the age of 79. Kenny Kimes, who is now 47 years old, is currently incarcerated at Richard J. Donovan Correctional Facility in California. The oldest son of Sante Kimes, Kent Kimes, was terrified of his mom, fearing that she may order his death from prison, knowing how much power she had over people. Kent said that as a kid, he and his family were always on the run because his mom was drawn to a life of crime. He cut all ties to her in 1998 after she used his daughter as a decoy in one of her many schemes. Kent remembered being arrested as a kid for shoplifting, an incident that drove his mother ballistic, but not because he stole, but because he got caught. She furiously told him how stupid he was for getting caught. She said, if you're going to do it, use the back door, make sure no one is looking, kind of like robbery 101. Kent escaped the family by training to become a pilot and starting his own family. Kent Walker wrote a book called Son of a Grifter, which fills in missing details of Sante's biography. Kent, Sante's eldest son and half-brother to Kenny, catalogs the wrongdoings of Sante, including everything from shoplifting and theft to multiple counts of arson, insurance fraud and slavery. Kent vividly recalls his childhood with Sante and her third husband, Ken Kimes, detailing how the couple indoctrinated him into criminality. Now, do you guys remember I mentioned at the beginning of this video about Kenny's friend, Vittorio, and how Sante would call Vittorio stupid and Kenny genius? Well, Vittorio Rajo actually became a college graduate entering medical school, so I, I assume that now he's practicing medicine. So, rhetorical question here, really. Who was the genius and who was the stupid one in the end? I mean, uh, there's a lot to deal with 
in this case and there's much more details out there but I didn't want to really stretch it out for very long there are a lot of interviews with Sante and Kenny on YouTube and I watched a few of them and basically Sante and Kenny keep going with trying to manipulate everyone into believing them I don't think I can show you anything from these interviews because uh, being part of documentaries as well I'm probably going to get a copyright issue from YouTube. Both of uh, Ken, Kenny and um, Sante say in these interviews that the evidence was planted by the police, the judge was biased, the police force was biased, the jury was biased. Effectively, they blame everyone but themselves. But Sante is really the worst, I think. From what I have seen, she had an explanation for absolutely everything. A comeback for every single crime they were accused of. I think that she was extremely manipulative to everyone, including her own husband and children. Kenny and Kent both grew up in that environment, but I'm not so sure that Sante was so manipulative of Kenny that he didn't realize what he did was wrong. Kent got out as soon as he saw that it's getting worse and worse, but Kenny decided to stay. Yes, Sante was controlling over him and told him everything, but I can't blame only her. I think that he's to blame as well. I also find their relationship very strange. During one of their interviews, they were even holding hands as if to show people and the media that they have this perfect kind of, you know, mother-son relationship. I don't know. I just, I just didn't buy it. And also there are a lot of rumors going around saying that maybe they had an incestuous relationship. Again, obviously this has been uh, vehemently denied by both of them. But like I said, there are just some really strange behaviors in those interviews with both of them. It, it seems more like a couple rather than a mother-child. Uh, I mean, this is just my opinion from what I have observed. And really, I can't find any excuse for Kenny's part in the crimes and I really think that they both got exactly what they deserved. Please guys, do let me know what do you think in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for staying with me. If you are interested in any of the makeup that I use for today's video, all of the products are linked in the description down below. For now, take care, stay safe and I will see you in the next one. Bye!